Hi there, everyone. Good afternoon. How's the energy level? Okay, we're going we're gonna to try to get it. We're going to raise it up here because this panel is what all day has been moving towards, right? Because we're trying to think about how to move the agenda forward. And I, and I think that every panel had a bit of this. And the last panel, hats off to, to Jonan in particular, who started you know, starting to change the conversation that it's not just about coal, right? It's about the other kinds of energy efficiency, demand-side management. Um, yeah, oh, I didn't say who I was. I'm Jennifer Turner. <laughs> it's in the program. Um, I direct the China Environment Forum at the Woodrow Wilson Center. And I've been working on energy and environmental is issues in China there for 13 years. I'm actually more of a water person. I'll give my, my pitch for water energy stuff later. I'm, I'm just the chair. But um, I want to make the intros really short because, well, you've, how many, Yang Fu Chang's been introduced about four times today, but he still works for NRDC. Uh, he's a senior advisor on climate and energy, 30 years experience. You have so many organizations. It's, 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 it's fabulous. I mean, WWF and National Lab. You know who he is. You're great. And I'm excited because he's going to talk about, kick us off on really talking about a roadmap moving forward. And Dan, he's not like, he's like Yan Fuk Chang, but he has all the affiliations now. Um, he's a visiting professor at Beijing University School of Law and Public Interest Program, senior fellow at Tsinghua U.S. China Center, fellow at Johns Hopkins University. It just keeps going on. I think you're on the board of Roots and Shoots. But so he's going to be talk, giving us a little bit the governance angle of thinking about moving forward because that also wasn't brought up much earlier today either. Not faulting the previous speakers, you spoke from your area of strength. So, Yang Fu Chang, you're going to kick us off, and they're very. And I've told them I'm very strict. That's 15 minutes because I think there's a lot of there's a lot of smarts out here in the audience. So we want to have a really rich discussion. And you told me your energy's okay, right? Check in. All right. Yang Fu Chang. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, NRDC have a proposed the coal cap. Uh, that is the first time and we think that it can be workable uh, in China. So, but now what is a political atmosphere or political environment change? So we understanding is uh, China uh, National People Congress is gathering uh, this week and we hope the new President and new premier will come out uh, next week, but this is uh, not uh, we can predict because this is uh, confirmed yet by the party uh, conference. And so we understand that Xi Jinping and will be a president, and Li Keqiang will be premier, and they have a very excellent record in the environment protection and ecological system protection. So that is uh, for sure. And so the, the question is asked us, do you think what is the legacy they will leave after 10 years? So they will compete, they will say, they will demonstrate their high uh, GDP growth rate compared to the previous administration? No. It's not they say they cannot do it because they, they don't want to do it. Uh, because, you know, uh, the, the question is the environment and social uh, problem and have to change. So I think legacy for this new administration is to get social harmonized and get environment can be protected well. So they have a many political feasibility. And a couple years ago, when I talked to the government official, I say, can I talk to you about coal cap? Nobody listened. They say, ah, oh, that's difficult. China needs more coal. And then a couple of months, I talk to them, and they say, okay, uh, let's talk. And then listen, but they say, difficult. But now, when we talk to them about the cold cap, and they say, yes, give me detail, so we can discuss. So we can see if it's workable, and so we can, you know, uh, and see if we can adapt or not. So I think is the political atmosphere and environment has changed. That is a very excellent idea. Two years ago, when we gathering uh, that, uh, in the meeting that organized by the Hewlett Foundation and Climate Works Foundation, and Jennifer and Peggy um, from Bloomer and I learned we get together. And in that time, when we talk about uh, how can we, you know, to wear China off the call, and everybody just think 
a couple of times, they say it's quite difficult. We understand this. We need a very comprehensive approach, not one, not a couple, but very comprehensive approach to, together uh, to do the cold cap. And so we can see what is the internal, uh, the e external cost, what is the cold cost can be increased, and what resources is the limitation for the land and for the water, and what is the technology CCS, and what is uh, 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 other substitution, renewables and natural gas, and, and what is uh, uh, other international experience, and can we can learn, and how can we still use the coal, um, but still have the Chinese economy growth. So we think that is a very complicated. So unfortunately, um, we come back, now we have initiated a couple of projects, and Kevin asked me, uh, my presentation focus on the NDRC, what project we are carrying out. And first is that we work with ERI, Energy Research Institute, and uh, uh, that is a, a system analysis center and to carry out what is a, a scenario study. The purpose of this scenario study will figure out what is a peak point and for the coal consumption. And later on, and when we can start, you know, this uh, picking uh, points for the coal consumption, that's not easy. Unfortunately, because China has carried out many scenario studies, and we understand a couple of years ago, and we have our first uh, scenario study for the carbon emissions, and people th think the, the peak point is around 2035. And then we have a more study, and most studies say, how about 2030? And we still have ILBNL study, they say, yeah, 2030 feasible and can be the uh, carbon emission a peak point. But for this new study, we try to focus on the coal and we try to say, is it possible we have more aggressive uh, scenarios? And second project is that we still working with ERI, that's a, we call the Energy Economical Center. And Chinese government, they have established the national cap for the energy. So that is their plan for this 25 years plan, and they will say, how can we disaggregate and to the local? Yeah, so our, our goal is a, is a consistency and with a total uh, energy uh, cap. The question is, uh, how can we interpret this total energy cap? Total energy cap is uh, excluding the renewables and others. But that is uh, important is that we have a ceiling um, for the coal and for the oil, but we have a bottom limitation as renewables, natural gas, and provide more rather than less. So we can use this one disaggregate and to the provincial level. And this is requirement is quite different with the United States. United States, for the domestic issue, a state government and play a major role for that. But in China, centralize the government institution and uh, ask the provincial have to listen or to implement the, uh, the central government policy and regulation well. Otherwise, they will not can be promoted, but will be uh, moved out from their position. So I think is uh, for the coal cap is quite difficult, uh, quite important is uh, this aggregate national level to the provincial level. But they have uh, many problems and questions. First one is the data, as I said. How can you, because they have a uh, 500 ton of the coal difference, local, you know, sum up and the total national one. So how can you disaggregate? So first one is that we have to spend a lot of resources and to do the data collection well. And third project is uh, we have a city coal cap. Unfortunately, uh, because the uh, air pollution came over, uh, that's bad, but it's good for our project. So everybody know, yeah, this project is good because we focus on the city. And city is uh, very important because they try to say, how can we use the coal? Is less or no or more? So we have to 
I think uh, have a couple groups, and one is a mega city. And based on our idea, in a mega city, no coal can be used. For instance, in Beijing, Shanghai, and Tianjin, um, but now they use a uh, a coal a lot. So we have to cut coal off and form this mega city. How about large city? How about small and medium city? So from this project, we come out this answer. And fourth is a sectorial coal cap. We just listen about the uh, uh, LBNL, and and they say they have a uh, you know do something about the buildings industry. So this is the same thing. Is uh, we have to work with the IIP and REP, and that is uh, funded by the Climate Works Foundations. And we work together and find in the power sector what kind of energy efficiency, what kind of a few uh, shifting and what kind of technology we can use to cut or reduce the coal use. And similar um, for the iron and steel, cement, and coal chemical industry. So I think that if we take our list, so every enterprises, every plan, they have a quota for this coal consumption. And, and five is uh, we like to use the U.S. the permit uh, this kind is a very good mechanism and to reduce the emissions. And in China, at the beginning, we say for the coal mining, we have to re examine what is a coal mine they can get permit and to, uh, to uh, operation. And so next is, I uh, say, in the power sector, um, what coal power plant, their emission can be cut. So how about uh, in other industry, boilers or other, so what is uh, they can use for the coal? So, so for this permit, and that is a powerful uh, you know, uh, the approach and a mechanism and to limit it, these consumers, coal consumers, to reduce uh, the coal consumption gradually. And six is the energy conservation and water. And we work with uh, Tsinghua University. We try to find out is energy conservation, energy efficiency, particularly for the power uh, saving, uh, electricity saving, how much the water we can save because we reduce the coal uh, consumption. So we got uh, uh, a good uh, uh, result, but we got in the phase two, we find out what is the water reduction can also and save energy. So that is uh, uh, phase two, we, we do that. And seventh is an alternative energy to substitute the coal. And so we think is a sale gas and renewables. And for sale gas, we work with Ministry of Environment Protection and see how can we first establish the regulation and standards and for sale gas development. And second is how to me, how can we enforce uh, these uh, enterprises and to follow or to obey these regulations and standards to meet all these requirements. Uh, for renewable, we form the financial support and financial aid or financial policy to see how can we scale up the renewable development. And because we learn in China, we say next two, uh, two decades or three decades, can we say China renewable is uh, account for uh, 30, 40 percent of total energy emissions? So we have to change our idea. So that is uh, for this, all this I just talking about, that is the top down. So we need a bottom up. And in China, we have uh, NGO uh, alliances we call the C plus program. And C plus program, we have 40, 43 uh, NGOs jointly announced this program. C plus program is a, is a cope with climate change. C is a, we, as an NGO, we like to do more uh, beyond the government commitment. And second is a beyond climate change. So C plus can help enterprises to gain the competition and also change the consumers behaviors. And so we think that we have this kind of C plus program and we got consensus. Everybody say we like to 
have a campaign, coal campaign, and from bottom up about coal, for instance, for the public health and for the air pollution in the city. So that is a way the NGO can can engage uh, in this uh, coal cap. Our conclusion is a uh, coal cap is uh, feasible, and we like to get more study, and then we can remove what is a barrier, and for this study, and third is uh, how can we work with Chinese government to design the coal cap and give them some idea and some suggestions, and can be work out and must win the coal cap. So last one is that we have to work together with enterprises and with NGOs. So we believe we have to fight very hard. One year doesn't work, we need two years more, five years, even 10 years. So uh, finally, uh, today, and so Dadi have said, he's a very, uh, 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 optimistic about the coal cap because now if you think the peaking point will come over very soon. Sooner than I thought, that is good news. Thank you very much. A lot of positive. That was positive. That was good. And uh, no, thank you so much. He kept the time. And now, um, Kind of keeping along with the same theme of thinking that weaning off coal really demands a comprehensive approach. And Dan, who is a, as I mentioned, is a lawyer, he also has a book that, now this is a, your book was translated into Chinese. No, it's with the vice, Fu Shu Ji. This is it's the Peking University Law School, first comparative, Zhong Mei, uh, Bi Jiao, uh, Gong Gong Li Yi Fa. So it's the first uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. comparing public interest law in the United States and China. And China. So I'm, I'm like, you know, fan of white here. Uh, right. So Hen Yois, what Shemesha governance? So here uh, today, we all wait for uh, Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang to tell us what they're going to do. Uh, Ambassador Roy says, we're waiting for the new American leadership. I thought you mean President Obama. He was elected. He said, no, no. Secretary designate Muniz and uh, Secretary Kerry. But we don't have to wait because Carnegie and Tsinghua have a, a conference, and NRDC announces a coal cap. So this is, this, is, uh, this is what we mean by governance and leadership, right? Well, I should say, our, I, Barbara Fenimore is a good friend, and I had dinner with her in the uh, Ling Guan in Hong Kong last week, and she said she's very excited because you're going to announce a coal cap, but there was some dispute inside NRDC. So now we see the result of these secret Nebu discussions. <laughs> The official NRDC policy on the coal cap is announced. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is the China-U.S. Uh, coal supply chain translating between operating systems. Zai Zhong Mei, Sao Zuo, Shi Tong, Zijian, Feng Yi. My little brother tells my mom, my Chinese is excellent when it's translated into Chinese. <laughs> In search of climate change, governance wedges a framework. Let's see, where's the, uh, the Kevin? Oh, here it is. Uh, so, a very overview. First, the premise I have, as we've heard today, American coal use may decline, but deep reliance continues elsewhere. There's no imminent technical solutions. There may be people who think there are, but we've got difficult problems in putting them to effect. Uh, therefore, understanding of the comparative dynamics of China and U.S. governance uh, are, is essential for cooperation. So I want to talk about the core concepts that I'm going to use, translating between operating systems, wedge, governance, and clues to translation, building blocks for China-U.S. governance comparison, and then uh, colon context, potential uh, governance wedges. So translating between operating system, the concept, we all can type a, 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 an email. If I'm in China, I tell my students to their BF or GF, boyfriend or girlfriend. We don't care if it's an Apple or a... Um, PC, but if you want to take the software from one system to the other, you've got to know the operating system. We live in a world where there's a global vernacular of governance. In Beijing, in uh, Washington, people use climate change, rule of law, civil society, CSR, as my students say, blah, blah, blah. However, in differing operating systems, the same words often have very different meetings. And so to work between the systems, you've got to understand the differences. 
as uh, my Beida colleagues always say, Ju Shang Yu Nan Zue Ju, Shang Yu Hai Bei Zue Ju. My pronunciation is terrible. My pronunciation is terrible, but I got to tell you, I don't know what it means because I'm told, <laughs> I'm told it means two things. One is that if you plant the seeds from an orange on the other side of the river, it's a tangerine. The other is, no, it's really an orange, but different name. <laughs> so I don't even know the translation. But when I, so my own core example as a lawyer is I went to China as part of a, uh, part of a Tsinghua, uh, with Chia, a research team on environmental governance. And as American, uh, the question I had is how does the law work, environmental law work in China? And the first thing you learn is there are a lot of environmental laws. The second thing I learned is it's the wrong question. <laughs> The law, Shema Falu, what's the use of law? It's not that there are no rules, but they're not the law. They're the plan, the Mubiao, uh, they're Qian Guizhe, uh, they're Hong Tao Wenjian, blah, 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 but they're not the law. So we got to talk about translating between the systems. That's one. Two, governance. What's governance? Basically the idea of making public purposes effective. This is actually a Cold War post-Cold War Western concept, and the idea is we don't like big socialist communist countries. Government is mama hoo hoo. You got to have it around, but we really need markets and civil society. The core of governance is really basic philosophical questions about what is human nature. Do we think people are self-interested uh, shits, as uh, our founding fathers said, who will only do something if you pay them? Or do we think uh, they're good people? If you educate them, they'll do the right thing. What about enterprises? Do they behave the same as individuals? And what about nations? We talk about trust. Is trust between China and the U.S. the same as trust between Jennifer and I? Jennifer and I can trust each other. Trust. Then, then, then China and the U.S. can trust each other, right? <laughs> you all know Sokolow in 2004 came up in the Scientific American with the wedge concept. Very similar to what we're talking about today or Amory Lovins in 1976, a path not taken. We've got all the technologies. It's just a matter of putting them into place. But as we all know, and as Sokolow wrote in the Bulletin Atomic Scientist two years ago, it ain't happened that quickly. Why hasn't it happened? Because of this general, we haven't got the governance systems to make them work. So some clues to translation between our two systems. One is pay attention to transitivity. Concepts that seem connected in one system may not be connected in another. I picked up Foreign Policy uh, Carnegie uh, magazine when I was waiting to get in today, and this lead article is, guess what? The American foreign policy premise that if you have middle class, you'll have democracy may be wrong. A lot of countries have middle classes, and it's not leading to democracy. So the concepts that are culturally connected in one context may not be in another. Point of entry. Learn that at uh, Tsinghua. We have laws, China has laws, but if you want to study how the system works, the point of entry may not be the law. Pay attention to context, obviously, Tian Shi, Di Li Ren He. Words in history matter, Fa Zhe, Fa Zhe. And attend to Zheng Guo Tu Si. China has everything the U.S. does with Zheng Guo Tu Si, but is Zheng Guo Tu Si just a little bit of a change or a maldun, a contradiction, right? Um, climate change is the example I use when I teach. Point of entry, what's the single most effective climate change rule in the world? Probably the one-child policy. And interestingly enough, when you look at the history by uh, Linda Greenhall, the anthropologist at Irvine, the uh, inside uh, the, the party uh, think tank that developed it in the late 70s actually read the Western environmentalists, the Ehrlich's The Population Bomb. The only people that took the Western environmentalists seriously were inside Deng Xiaoping's party and acted on it. So one-child policy, obviously not about climate change, about too many people, too few resources. When you go to China, Chinese obviously can talk about climate change, but too many people, too few resources. One-child policy, not in a law, in a policy. The 11th five-year plan, the Jinang Mubiao, again, probably the most effective climate change rule in the world, in the last five or ten, five years, other than the CFC Montreal Protocol, perhaps, but not about climate change and not in a law. Now, the 12th five-year, Ditan Fajan, obviously is more directly about climate change, but not in the law. Co-benefits, 
critical in both countries, as Jennifer has been studying, and we're talking about water energy nexus, for example, because to make things work, you've got to have co-benefits. They may differ between countries. Those of us in China last week see the interesting effort to get rid of gutter oil, digoyo, by turning it into biofuels and tweaking the system. It's a great win-win. We've got to tweak the pricing structure. And, of course, a deep co-benefit in both countries is tremendous income inequality, income inequality. Um, environmental governance frames wedges. When I teach, I, I try to organize. This is what I use. Anybody who wants to add or subtract concepts. Different kind of wedges, the way that uh, Sokolow had technology wedges. The first is Hardin. Uh, many, most of you probably read The Tragedy of the Commons. The premise is we are in a world where there are some problems that have no technology fix. The core problem is too many people. Human beings are self-interested. You can't tell people to be good. The only way to solve, we can solve the problem, but we can only do so by limiting freedom, limiting the right to reproduce. So ironically, when you read Hardin again, you see it's not about sustainability. Sustainability isn't the problem. It's really to get to sustainability, you have to limit freedom. When I taught Hardin first in the U.S. at AU, I said, well, this is interesting. It'll never happen. But you go to China, that's what China did. That's what the one-child policy is. Indeed, China has a one-car policy in Beijing and Shanghai. It has a one-house policy, the house sister, right? It has a one-dog policy in Beijing. We don't do that. And so this is a core difference in systems. Aldo Leopold, in my own view, Kongza, Confucius, a notion that people are inherently capable of learning. If you tell them to do the right thing, they'll do it. So the possibility people can change. Eleanor Ostrom, of course, the great first woman Nobel economic laureate, who uh, sort of responded to Hardin by saying, no, it isn't a tragedy because we can conceive of new ways of cooperating and competing and produce sustainability. That Governance, in a way, is a kind of technology that people can create. And McKinsey, I, I, I like to beat up on McKinsey, the Green Revolution. We can do this all with technology, no problem, except if you read the report, it says, well, we can't do it because it's going to cost too much and it's very complicated. Um, using governance frames for comparison. So Hardin, as I explained, is a core comparison between the U.S. and China. In fact, when I hear uh, uh, Fuchang, the, 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 the coal cap, I mean, this is consistent. We're going to do it. We're going to cap coal. I was talking with Paul Jaffe, and Paul points out the right to coal would probably not be a right in the U.S. Nobody says there's a right to coal, right? But it's sort of consistent with the notion of when the, the central authority wants to limit, it can do that. Uh, in the U.S., of course, we're greater per capita GDP, uh, greenhouse gas, but we avoid direct legal regulation, limits on rights. The Obamacare debate was, well, you know, the government can't tell which grandmother should die, but the market will do it anyway. It's, oh, we do it by the market, not by government. Um, Leopold, the, the, the eth ethics frame, again, in China, the notion is we can educate uh, through, uh, we can educate people. The American Madisonian view is people are self-interested. You've got to pay them off. Now, when I live in China, most of my friends are actually Madisonian. They believe in interests, not ethics. But we look at PM 2.5, right? And so this is a, a core question. Now, everybody knows PM 2.5 is indeed PM 2.5, not haze. But the question is, so what? Now that you know it, what do you do? And now uh, Yang Fuchang is going to tell the NGOs, this is what you do, right? So it's the... I'd say the Confucian context, the Leopold context of education, but you need the path. Uh, using Ostrom frame, different rule sets. Again, as I say, a core difference between U.S. and China governance. In America, law is the dominant rule set. You want to know how something works? You say, what's the law? Does it work? In China, that's not it. It's the plan. It's the Yundong, the movement. It's the Hong Tou Wenjian. It's the EGN. It's the Qian Guizhe, blah, blah, blah. Implementation, an example of a core failure, and I see Steve Wilson in it, that we had this, this dialogue last week, the permit system. Permits are the bedrock of American clean air, clean water. you got too many corporations to, to regulate. We have a permit system. We don't trust the corporations, but we have a legal system to regulate. China has the same laws in general, but the permit system, uh, to, to take from Steve, I hope it's not yet fully recognized. It's going to be there, right? <laughs> But the permit system is a core example. It's not in the plan. It's not in the law. Steve and I will discuss it later. Central-local relations, a core fascinating comparison. 
First thing you get to China, my colleagues say, China and the U.S., very similar. Strong traditions of local control. Mountain is near, emperor is far. You say, well, China, it's unitary. America's federal. No, you go to China, Difang Baohu, Mianza Gongcheng, GDP Zhongyao. Beijing is right. If only these locals would do the right thing, right? So we've got the same kind of tensions and paradox. Industry pressures for innovation. My own view, and I see my Duke colleague here, is that the electric industry in America has historically been a slug. The only thing that's forced change in the electric industry is from pressures from outside competitors. Municipal electrics opened up the transmission system, IPPs opened up the, the vertical disintegration of the system, and industrial generators, Dow Chemical, most famously, famously said, we're not going to stick with these high-priced uh, Duke Power people, we're going to go cogen, right? So comparative in industry structures, shared global supply chains, talk about that, pressure from the bottom. I don't, I think NGOs in China is, are notoriously, very famously weak, I got two minutes, but what we've got today are a whole new kind of from the bottom pressure. People have talked about the Y ball as the new NGO. We've got a Wei Chuen, and then the governance of innovation. If I could just make a, let's see if we really fit this in. Where does coal fit in? So coal fit in, I want to talk a little bit about the supply chain because that's an interesting thing. If I can just finish with this point. The global supply chain, because, you know, Kevin says this is about supply chain. So it's like, I've got to get harmonious society into the speech. I've got to get the Obama slogan into the speech. I've got to get the supply chain in the speech. <laughs> We're talking about a globalized world. I have not recently been asked by, for advice by the Secretary of State, the head of Fog Way, or anybody like that. I work from the bottom. I you know, represent workers. I represent whistleblowers. You've got a global supply chain. China has a very good set of laws. You can't go to the court in China, but the laws are good. What you're really going to see in the frontier is the, the using of China laws and lawyers and NGOs with American courts and American lawyers working together. So a core example is you've got a global supply chain where you've got a company exporting coal to China, where you've got Walmart in China, where you've got Apple in China poisoning people with N-hexane, 137 workers in Suzhou. You've got good China laws, and you're going to see people using the courts in China, as the, in U.S., as leverage, using American corporate law as leverage on making the China environmental laws work, or in the NRDC context, making the cap work, if it's in a law. So, for example, last uh, two weeks ago, the, the Delaware Chancery Court, our core for body for regulating American and corporations that want to deal in America, uh, the judge, uh, chief judge, said in a hearing about a, a China coal company listed in the U.S., if you're going to have a company in, in, uh, for domiciled for purposes of its relation with investors in Delaware, and the assets and operations of that company are situated in China, in order for you to meet your obligations of good faith, you better have retained accountants and lawyers who are fit to maintaining a system of controls over a public company. So I look at this from the bottom. I look at it as someone who works with uh, consumers, workers, whistleblowers, but also investors, that the engines of our cooperation, we heard again and again today, is 500 billion of commercial transactions. And so I don't, I don't have any access to President Obama, much less Xi Jinping. But we all have access to the people on the bottom. And the laws, as an American, this is the American perspective, and there are now China laws, can be made to work as a lever on the supply chain. So the whole point of this exercise, to conclude, is if uh, Duke and uh, Joe Dadi can invent new technologies to fix this stuff, that's terrific. But I listened to these conversations, and I listened to everybody talk about building efficiency. I was around when Jimmy Carter said he was going to change the world and everything would be, if there'd be no coal by 1982. Uh, it hasn't happened. These are governance issues, and you want to know where the points of entry, where are the issues. Final point, low-carbon cities, subnational, very important. I work with Nanjing University. We're advising Suzhou on its low-carbon plan. I'm thinking, where is the connection between this conversation and the people who are advising all the Ditan Fajan projects in the cities? What is Suzhou's authority and capacity to limit coal use, right? Where does that fit? Now, in the U.S., we know states have authority over power plant siting and things like uh, renewable portfolios. China provinces don't have that, but they've got equally powerful levers. They own the land, and they own the companies, right? So you've got a whole kind of set of governance questions. If you're going to have a cap from NRDC, and 
So Joe says, what are we supposed to do, right? We don't control the electricity source. It ain't going to work. It's an unfunded mandate, just like in the U.S. It's going to be, uh, you know, fake stuff. So you've got to begin to look at the system, and that's uh, more than I was allowed to talk by Jennifer, and I apologize. Thank you. Okay, at the end of the day here, we have wedges and caps. So I'm, I'm going to open up to you guys, but I'll occasionally jump in. So some questions, and ha hold your hand high. Say, you've asked a question at every panel, sir. <laughs> but the, he's a, he's hard, I, he's, you're getting my star for the most inquisitive participant here today. Please. The, the reason I... Oh, say your name again, because some people uh, weren't here yes, earlier. Zhong Xiang from Funan University. The reason I raised the question is because the uh, organizer paid me to speak yesterday. <laughs> so it was canceled, so I saw this. Uh, at least I should be something. Otherwise, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, I cannot uh, for the taxpayer. Uh, it's okay. It's yeah. Yeah. You know, my question is uh, my general comment to the Dan is: uh, you talk about the governance, and uh, you know, is uh, we all observe that uh, you know you see the uh, struck for the high GDP growth and the local governance and uh, fees project and so on. You know, is uh, if you look at the media and all these reports. Give people the impression that the central government of China have a very high moral standard. Oh, we want to have a good environment. And, and pay to the, pay to the local government are very bad because, you know, you guys just, uh, you know, trying high economic growth and don't care about the environment. I, I, I wrote a very lengthy article called the Effective Environment Protection in the Context of Government Decentral Decentralization. One of my main arguments there is uh, this kind of mess to some extent, it's also caused by central government. You know, the central government should take, also take a big part of this plan. The reason I make that is, uh, you know, in 1994, China had the tax uh, sharing reform. And from that year on, you find is uh, government revenue, central government revenue, was the total sum of local and uh, central is 75%. But in the meantime, central government expensive is a percentage of local and the central government expenses only about 25 cents. Then you find is uh, local government only have about 25 e revenue, but you have to pay for 75 expensive. So what can happen? That only can drive economic growth is trying to cover camp. You know, so that is one of the things when you look at the government, these are very broad issues. You should not only blame a lot of government for something go wrong. Yeah? Do you have something short in response or just say you're right? Or? <laughs> of course I agree with you. That's why I say it's a paradox. Two points. One is where do the central government officials work before they go to Beijing? They work at the local government. So they're bad when they're in the local government and they're good when they're in Beijing. Two is, as our colleague Chie says, the remarkable rise of China was in part local, local competition. The local governments are very good at GDP competition. The question is now that they're can they make the transition to green competition? That's, you're right, it's a deeply puzzling question. And as a foreigner, I think this is a nice creation to say that we, we, we hate our local government, but we love government. Yeah. Can yeah. they make the transition? Um, oh, and turn your mic on, too. Oh. You push that button down below. Sorry. Yeah. There we go. Uh, the answer is I don't think so uh, if the discussion is at this level of we're going to. Uh, and this is. This is not a, if it's just we're going to have a cap, unless it's down at the local level of well, how the hell does this work? If I'm a local leader, I don't care what city, I've got the law, I've got the plan, I've got what my leader says, I've got your tax and, you know, local problems. You know, the, you've got too many rule sets. My hypothesis is China is riding too many horses, that the five, the planning system will focus on one or two big items. But if you're going to need, all the problems that China has, this is just one of them to be addressed. The, the current rule system is not yet adequate. And that gets into transparency. CCTV asked me to be on the set Sunday on the corruption issue. There obviously you all know the issues. But the, uh, political change is necessary, by which I don't mean necessarily changing the leaders, but I mean the rule system. I think that there, there's a hunger in the room for you, Yang Fuchang, yeah. to maybe talk a little, I, I mean, I think I personally was really intrigued by the the, one of the projects, your city coal cap project. And I wonder if you could maybe tell us a little bit more about, like, where is that project? You know, it's, 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 you're already on the ground. And just tell us a little bit, I mean, how it's working, who you're engaging. Um, for this uh, city coal cap, and we work with uh, 
uh, People's University (ERI) and and the Chinese Academy of Environment Planning together, and we try to figure out for these uh, more than three hundred cities, and that is a uh, population is over five hundred thousand. Uh, five hundred thousand. And first is that we try to figure out what is the uh, coal in this city. We understand for this uh, uh, air pollution mark, and we come out, we can see what is the uh, Beijing uh, coal consumption. That is a 23 million ton. For Tianjin, that is a 70 million ton, equal to the UK total. So for the Hebei provinces, and that is some, something like states, that is about the 300 a billion town. And for Shandong is uh, near Beijing, another city, that is a uh, 400 million town. Total, only these two cities, two provinces, equal to U.S. total coal consumption. So that's no wonder their air pollution come out is uh, that the scale is so large. So for the city, I think that is the first uh, area and we like to work with, and that is uh, have a, a much leverage and to put the coal cap on that. But but when, oh, well, okay. You, you're running it. You're not, okay, go ahead. He needs a mic. Uh, Kevin Tu at Carnegie Endowment. I have a technical issue to ask uh, Dr. Yang Fu Chang. Just now you mentioned uh, at NRDC, uh, your program uh, is uh, investigating how to disaggregate the national coal cap to a provincial level. Because uh, you also mentioned, that, like uh, in 2010, if we add the uh, provincial coal consumption together, uh, it may be 22% uh, higher than the national coal consumption. In such a national circumstance, how could we uh, make the disaggregated target meaningful at the local government level? And, and pass the mic to Do you want to answer? You can answer yeah, that. First, I'll do it together. We'll do two together. So oh, go okay. ahead. Are you sure? Yes. Or is yours really hard? Yeah. Okay. What's your... my, uh, my name is Chin Nguyen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. My question is more for uh, Dr. Turner. Uh, you said that you work a lot with water. So I have a question regarding the current water situation in okay. China. How does that affect the coal uh, industry? And how do you see it? when you apply the coal cap. And together with that, I haven't heard about the labor uh, force. So if the coal industry has been supplying 70% or more energy in China, how does that affect the, un the employment rate and the unemployment rate if you apply the coal caps on it? Thank you. So good to, we got three good questions here. Why don't you start off okay. with the first one from and, and the last one of hers, I think, too. Well, I will say for the uh, local disaggregation for the coal cap and we work with Energy Research Institute. And because they work with the N NDRC about the total uh, energy cap and they find out this problem. And because uh, particularly is the oil and coal, because these two fossil fuel, we like to have a coal cap on that. They have a no big problem for the oil, but for the coal it is. Uh, so I think is that we have to find uh, you know resources to do and is pro maybe province by province and to get uh, data right, and that takes time. I understanding, uh, but if we don't do that, and with the central government negotiate with local government, it's difficult to convince them and to take the the number and disag uh, aggregate it. And uh, so that is one. But we have to understanding is uh, coal cap is not mean by 2020. If we put is a uh, four billion ton of coal, you cannot exceed. Not, that's not my idea. My idea is to uh, say if we work all the very hard together, use all the means, all the resources, but we can get something like 4.2 billion ton of coal. But if we have a no coal cap, maybe go up to five billion. So, so that is not the accurate number we we have to work. But this is a way, and and so uh, so far because coal issue, we have tried many policies, many years, 
but never work out. So, so I think this time is a government. They have at least political uh, momentum, so we we can like to work with the government to to design the coal cap well. And and maybe to to jump to her last question there that that as and and, and the coal cap it wouldn't it's not it doesn't start tomorrow. But the question of the labor, uh, I, mean, I assume you're talking about the miners and you know. Yeah, coal cap. If we finally try to get a peak point. So how can we get there? Well, uh, personally, I think we have uh, uh, three phases. First phase is uh, how can we reduce the coal consumption growth rate annually? So that's his phase. So now, because every year the coal consumption is a, is a very uh, the growth is a very high, and second is uh, how can we reduce the coal share in the total energy mix so we can reduce now from seventy percent to 60% to 50% gradually. And finally, the coal cap is a very important is phase three. So we have to figure out what is a peak point um, for the coal consumption. So maybe 2020 or by 2025, we don't know. But finally, is uh, China now is a uh, carbon, uh, large carbon emitters. So we hope this can be sooner to get this carbon emission uh, the peak point and the coal cap in that years. Did you want to say something about the labor? I can't help but note, because this is obviously a, a core issue in America, the jobs issue, is that the politically correct answer to the question in both countries is green jobs, right? Now, the question, and, and the politically correct answer is it's win-win. So the answer to your question is, no problem, we're going to have green jobs. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and, and, um, I was actually going to, one of my questions I was going to ask for him, you kind of helped me say it. I was really excited when I, you know, heard that, that in your coal cap work that you have, you took some of our choke point ideas, yes? The idea that water and coal are connected. We did it at Wilson Center with Circle of Blue. We did, we've been working for two years looking at how energy development in China is impacting water. And in China, that's a story of coal. Northern China has almost no water. It's about 20% of the country's water, and that's where the coal resources are. And it's creating quite a tight squeeze. It's starting to push off agriculture from north central to the northeast. And, and there's, you know, we estimated, you know, bringing numbers from like his ERI partners and the Ministry of Water Resources that really the choke point that they really don't have enough water to get this coal out. And that in itself is, is something that probably also encourages your, your coal cap argument. But then the flip side, the question of how much energy does water use in China? I mean, in the United States, I think, I mean, we know we, in California, moving and cleaning water uses about 20% of the state's electricity. We don't know those numbers yet for China. China doesn't even turn on all their wastewater treatment plants. We want them to turn it on. But I think that one thing that in, in conversations at the Wilson Center, and I think and, and, um, NRDC is, it wants to start as well, is to, is to have the Chinese government, business, and researchers and NGOs look at the question of the energy footprint of water. I mean, the, if you look at it, the water sector is a high energy intensive sector, but it's never been looked at it that way. I mean, and, and so it's, it's a new way of thinking, and we're hoping to stimulate. That wasn't what you meant, or? No, I, I agree with you, but I think China has been building, building huge dams. There's that too, but yeah. Yeah, I mean that's that's another that's a we'll have to, you have to come to my shop and talk about that. I don't want to steer too far away from coal cap today, but all right, some other qu I got over here, Peggy. Oh, make sure it's on. Peggy Duxbury with Bloomberg Philanthropies. Um, good to see you again, Dr. Young. Um, my question is on the relationship between the public health the air pollution and coal. And um, the, now they know it's, you know, now there's much better data that it's not haze. We know exactly in real time the PM 2.5 in various cities, and it's not just from a couple of monitoring devices on top of the U.S. Embassy. It's much more ubiquitous now. How, um, how much of that is apportioned to the coal generation, and, and I know it, it differs from different cities, but, but roughly how much of that PM and other pollutants are directly related to coal generation, and how much, sort of second part to that question, how much 
A lot of our EPA rules are health-based standards and are based upon public health. And it seems like in China, it's coming at it from a different perspective. And I'd be interested in both of your thoughts on, you know, how much of a game changer is it that it's not haze, it's PM 2.5 with real data. Um, is that going to change the dialogue? And how much will that start to get health-based risk assessment and get involved in some of these, these rules and laws that are unfolding? Okay. Uh, uh, for instance, in Beijing, um, um, for this PM 2.5 pollutions, and they have an initial study, uh, it's not complete, uh, they have to do more, is 16% uh, in Beijing area is uh, from coal. Um, but Beijing area cannot solve the PM 2.5 because they have a transmit, and this PM 2.5 from other area. And from outside area is uh, about 25 to 30 percent. So if we add up, this is a coal contributes uh, for Beijing PM 2.5 is about 30 to 35 percent. In fact, this is precisely the question I've been discussing both with my Johns Hopkins and with my uh, Nanjing classes. We had a we do a teleconference course, which I'm doing tonight, and I asked about the PM 2.5. First, it's a cultural perception. The Americans from Johns Hopkins thought out of 20 million Beijingers, 5 million will get sick today, and in 15 years, maybe 10 million will die. The Chinese said, nah, not that big a problem, right? So one is a cultural perception. Two is, you know, epidemiology is extremely difficult. Uh, it's just expensive and not yet really getting started. Bloomberg, Bloomberg Public Health School at Hopkins, where I teach, of course, is a leader. And one of the things that came up, and this gets to the question, I think, of the coal cap, but the many challenges and the priorities. One of my Nanjing students uh, brought the recent Lancet, you know, Lancet is the science magazine, and ranking of uh, health hazards, uh, uh, air was like number nine, number six was diet. So a question is, what's the greater threat to young Chinese people? McDonald's, Coca-Cola, you know, or PM 2.5. And so I guess the, the point is, we all know PM 2.5 is a deep problem, but in relation to the totality of other health problems, right, what do we know in terms of making public choices is, is another question. Finally, people are voting with their feet. As you know, people are saying, I'm not going to move to Beijing. That may be a bigger effect than, than the coal cap or people leaving Beijing. Yeah, but we do know that, that, I mean, but that asthma, I mean, it's, it's skyrocketed. In it's Beijing, in and it's China. and it's number four in China. It's, it's not number eight, right? Yeah. And and I I was just you know um, just heard that that in the past decade that that lung cancer has has gone up four hundred percent in China. You know, it's just I mean that that was you know on the Diane Reem show we heard the interview. So it's you know it's there and but that's what's an interesting thing too in China is in the last few years the Ministry of Health. It has is no longer silent on the pollution health issue, and that's that's something that I thought is is it's kind of helping to raise the public consciousness and and their kind of you know their literacy of the linkages between. But, 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 but this is I have this discussion with Steve often. Part of the I call a difference because China is a developing country and we're quote developed, is our exposures are uh, small, not acute. The effects are long term and latent. In China, you have multiple acute exposures. And so my Chinese colleagues, we talk about going to court, they say, yeah, obviously we're sick because of pollution, but there are so many possible causes, it's hard to separate out. Not limit, least of which is tobacco, which, you know, is a dramatic compounding effect. So to isolate the coal, I mean, I, I'm not a scientist, but it's, it's a question of public policy, what you're isolating. I think I have time for maybe one more question or two quick questions. All right. No pontificating, just a quick question. I can uh, be My name is Rena. I'm a student at the University of Maryland. So my question is to Dr. Yang. You, in your presentation, you mentioned both the provincial disaggregation and also the sector approach uh, in terms of the co-cap. Uh, so based on the studies you mentioned, uh, could you please comment on um, which method do you think fits better or tends to be more effective in the Chinese context? Thank you. Uh, yes, why we have a sector approach and a local approach, I think is uh, we just learn from the previous experience and from uh, energy intensity. 
uh, target. Energy intensity uh, target, uh, central government only disaggregate this target to the local, not to the sector. So we think that uh, maybe is, uh, if we have a sector approach, seems is, uh, you know, work much uh, efficient. Um, because in the sector, and we understand all these technology well, and so, uh, so we can uh, disaggregate this to the enterprises. But if only located uh, this uh, number in the local, but local they have uh, no this kind of capacity. They are not say every province's uh, government official, no uh, cement factory technology all. So they are difficult for them to handle this uh, uh, reduce the uh, uh, energy intensity. So we learn that kind of experience, and we think that is a uh, uh, three dimensions. You know, is the timing, uh, that is the time, horizontal, and then we have a uh, vertical is a sectorial level and the local. So in this case, three dimension, and we see every enterprises. No way you can escape. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Watch out for Yang Fuchang. Okay. You meant the last thing, because I'm the chair, so I'm doing the last question. Are you guys okay with that? Good, all right, good. You have no choice. I have the mic. Um, the, the, the one p aspect of yours that's also really intriguing is the bottom-up coal campaign. And you mentioned that there are 43 NGOs involved in the C-plus alliance. Can you give us a couple examples of, of a few of the types of – what does the campaign look like? I mean, there's multiple, I'm sure – I'm yeah, uh, for the C plus program, and that is the uh, first time the Chinese NGO uh, announced this program in the international negotiation, and um, because we think the following years, and Chinese government NGO and Chinese enterprises and will play a very important role in the negotiation. And so far, we are not ready yet for NGO because EU, uh, uh, Europe, uh, European uh, NGO is much better. So for this uh, uh, C plus, and we have a couple of projects now is uh, moving. And first is that uh, we have a couple of projects in the university, and we think that's quite important is educate young people. What is the climate change? How can we do it ourselves? And for instance, I challenge when the meeting I challenge the young people. I say if we think uh, in the Beijing, we if we see every drivers and they drive car to the work, and so. Uh, if we ask them what your education level, and most people say, I graduated from university. But you have to understand this P2, PM 2.5 climate change, why you still like to drive the SUV or others. And so, so that is uh, quite important is that we uh, learn is that in the university, how can we work together with the young people and they understand this concept well. So in the future, that is a long fight. Uh, for the climate change, so we hope to educate the young people. Another is uh, in the building sector. And the Chinese government, they have a set for each buildings what is the uh, standards. And so we uh, find out how can we make more efficient, higher than the government's requirement. And so that is uh, uh, in the building. And in the prices, we also find the enterprises. And the government have asked them to reduce the CO2 or improve the energy uh, uh, inten uh, uh, intensity, but we say, can you do better and help them to calculate? And, and finally, they say, yeah, we can cost effective, we can you know, uh, the, the improve the higher target. So in this case, we, uh, 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 we, we like to say uh, for the cold cap and for the public health, and I think that is the area NGO can do better than other organizations. And, and, and what we find out is that all the uh, NGO uh, uh, get consensus. So for uh, they like to involve in the cold cap. And so that they'll they'll be involved in also doing more broader kind of public education campaigns and awareness raising. Yeah. Okay, it's exciting. So so you guys, you heard it here, NRDC change in China. So um. Any, I'll give you any final comment, or we're going to... Yeah, uh, Shanghai Roots and Shoots, the most vibrant NGO, I think, certainly in Shanghai, and China works with over 200 schools, hundreds of volunteers. When are you going to talk to them? That, that's a challenge. And <laughs> then, because see, see, then you'd be taking your, your, the coal literacy down to the, to the kids. Yeah. Which is, you know, yet another, out, you know, and, 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 and Roots, that's it, so... Yeah, okay, so, another matchmaking thing happened. Yeah, for up NGO, here. we have a local NGO also, uh, because China, we, uh, we call the 
uh, uh, NGO association, that is a government affiliate, but that is a part of our C plus program. So in the local, so far is a more than, I guess is a 150 or 200 NGO locally. In, in your C plus? Or uh, just no, in, in general a, in China? Uh, yeah, NGO association, that is a part of the C plus program. And so we can work with them and say, bring all these local together and uh, join our uh, city code cap. And, and that can, can be much easier to work out. Okay, and I, and I bet we could find a lot of this info on the website. And yeah, thank you so much. And um, hey, big hand of applause for these two gentlemen, please. <laughs> and I think we're going to clear the stage because Kevin's getting ready to do his closing. Are you ready? You're doing your closing. I want to thank you all for listening today and your good questions at our panel. My name is Kevin Tu. Uh, I organized uh, today's event uh, uh, with Dr. Mani Wei at uh, Tsinghua BP Clean Energy Center. So I'd like to close today's uh, uh, event. Uh, first, I'd like to share some stats I prepared for, to compare the Chinese and the U.S. coal. When we look at uh, China's uh, national fossil fuel reserves, 95% of uh, the total resource is just coal. Only 5% are oil and gas. So that's why 70% of China's uh, primary energy consumption uh, is from coal. And uh, the country is expected to continuously to use coal to sustain its economic development. However, even given China's national circumstance, I would like to say, if possible, if there's any alternative uh, available, the country should try very hard not to use so much coal. In 2010, coal-filled carbon emissions in China were 70% higher than uh, national carbon dioxide emissions in the United States, which is the second largest uh, carbon emitters in the world. But uh, when we look at uh, the policy priority in China, actually uh, air pollution and water contamination probably have much higher uh, uh, policy priority than climate change. So we all need to take uh, such uh, issue into consideration when we work on uh, China's uh, energy and climate issues. Compared with the uh, U.S., uh, China both produce and uh, consume much more coal, or about uh, half of global total. If we compare energy mixture between U.S. and China, United States only rely on coal for about 22% of uh, national uh, energy consumption, and China is significantly higher. The picture in the electricity sector is basically the same. Uh, China use, uh, uh, um, uh, produce about 80% of its electricity from uh, coal. So that's why um, whenever we want to deal with uh, global climate challenge, we need to deal with uh, China's coal sector first. Now, I'd like to uh, review today's uh, four uh, panels. The first one is how to clean the Chinese coal value chain. During the panel discussion, uh, I am relatively confident to say uh, every, every expert probably can agree upon that China needs to accelerate the peaking of national coal consumption and uh, national carbon dioxide emissions. The problem is how fast the, the country should achieve such a goal and uh, by which type of methods. Nowadays, it's rather difficult to work on uh, China's uh, climate policy because uh, basically there's two approaches. The one approach is the, the politically correct way to work with the government, which means uh, we are aiming to bring incremental change to the system 
which means we need to propose policy recommendation that's politically feasible. The another approach uh, is more radical. Of course, uh, if we uh, look at uh, Chinese uh, coal and climate issue from an environmental perspective, it would be nice uh, if I can propose 100 US dollars per ton of uh, carbon tax uh, in China, or if I propose the Chinese utilities to be CCS ready in five or 10 years. So this is uh, uh, this type of dilemma is every energy um, analyst needs to face when working in China. So, but uh, my personal view is uh, uh, currently there are so many good uh, energy analysts, both in China and outside China, who are very familiar with China's uh, national energy circumstance. But uh, what currently the country needs most probably is uh, uh, some radical idea that can depart uh, significantly from the status quo. Uh, how to change the mentality of uh, both uh, the expert community and also decision makers in China? Uh, I personally feel this is very important for the country to um, offer some solutions for global energy and climate solutions. The second panel is the management of coal in the United States. Both uh, Carlos and Scott uh, uh, have mentioned that shale gas development uh, in the United States uh, are very important uh, energy phenomenon uh, with profound environmental implications. Because of the uh, lower gas price, uh, there, uh, I, I personally consider uh, the shale gas development in this country is a, um, a double-edged sword. On the w one hand, the carbon emissions have certainly been slowed down. But on the other hand, the renewable development in this country has also been retarded. So this is uh, something the environmental community uh, should uh, uh, look more in the future. The third panel uh, is about U.S.-China collaboration on coal. Before uh, uh, this panel start, I actually talked with uh, both Casey and Dadi, asked them to talk more about barriers that prevent the realization of the full potential of uh, bilateral collaboration between the world's largest two energy producers and consumers. If we look at the treaty and agreement signed between these two countries, more than 200, if I uh, uh, remember the number correct, uh, that's, uh, that's huge. Uh, of course, if we look at uh, the scale of the energy sector in both countries, this number of agreement uh, it actually shouldn't be a surprise. But the problem is how to move uh, the energy and the climate agenda from talking to uh, concrete bilateral actions. Uh, that's uh, something uh, I think uh, experts in both countries need to explore more in the future. And uh, whenever we look at U.S.-China collaborations, we need to understand the difference in terms of national circumstance in uh, U.S. and China. In the United States, uh, we have a small government here. In China, we have a very big government. Sometimes um, from the perspective of the outside world, the central government in Beijing uh, can almost do everything uh, to every part of the energy sector. However, from the enforcement perspective, what's the policy impact of so many of China's uh, environmental and energy regulation? Uh, that's something um, I'd like uh, my colleagues from China to 
think twice before uh, they go back uh, to China. And the fourth session uh, is very cheerful. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Jennifer, and also for these last two speakers. Uh, they can uh, have such an interesting discussion uh, first about how to keep the Chinese uh, uh, national energy and coal consumption. I personally believe to accelerate uh, the peaking of coal consumption is probably one of the most uh, important issues the Chinese government and also the energy expert and academia community should uh, uh, look into in the future. But uh, I may disagree with the current approach proposed by the National Energy Administration. Whenever uh, uh, regulation is implemented in a country as large as China, um, I personally feel uh, it's always uh, a good idea to look at uh, what's the uh, side effects of each energy and environmental regulation. I look, uh, this year, actually, I was uh, a little bit upset about uh, China's national coal production in um, 2012 because the NDRC set an intermediate uh, coal production target uh, for year 2012. Then, in the end, the coal production in December 2012 uh, become much lower than I expected before, and uh, uh, in the end, maybe uh, from the start, the target uh, probably has been partially met. For the, uh, for the Xi Wen administration, one of the um, scenario proposed by uh, President Xi is uh, a beautiful China. But uh, whenever we look at uh, the scenario of a beautiful China, we can have it uh, in reality. We can also have it uh, on paper uh, from a different type of government stance. So this actually is quite important issues. And uh, uh, this call uh, some fundamental change of the Chinese uh, statistical connection system. Uh, then uh, Dan talked about the governance issues, and uh, of course, uh, uh, governance uh, can be easily be lost uh, in, uh, during the translation between the United States and China. When we look at uh, uh, the snow uh, uh, legislation process in the United States, uh, many uh, Outsiders uh, may not uh, fully understand what's going on, but uh, I am not an uh, uh, um, uh, American citizen, so I am also an outsider, uh, but who is based in Washington, D.C. Uh, one phenomenon I have noticed is whenever a uh, United Nation is adopted in this country, people become uh, quite serious in terms of uh, uh, how to meet the target and uh, uh, how to uh, make uh, the regulation work. Uh, in comparison, when we look at uh, uh, what's going on in China, maybe uh, it's relatively easy uh, in China to adapt uh, any sort of uh, environmental and energy uh, regulation, especially those ambitious energy targets. But uh, the enforcement uh, side of the story uh, should uh, be improved in the future. That's my uh, personal view. And uh, when we look at the Chinese coal value chain, from resources to mining to transport to end use, this is such a complicated uh, system. The more time I spend on China's uh, coal value chain, the less certain 
I become about some of my policy recommendations. So that's why uh, I wish I can continuously collaborate with uh, many of you in this room uh, to improve uh, my ongoing research on the Chinese co-value chain. Of course, if some of those uh, mistrust between the United States and China can be eliminated in the future, and uh, the energy security side of the, uh, the, the security uh, perception of the Chinese decision maker can be easier uh, in, over time, I am pretty confident uh, the environmental performance of the Chinese co-value chain can be improved over time too. Thank you very much. Before I close uh, uh, this conference, I, I'd also like to uh, thank all the um, guests who stay so late, and uh, also I'd like to express my sincere appreciation for all the experts who speak uh, at this conference, especially the Chinese guests from Beijing, Shanghai, and Carlos from Paris. And also, I'd like to express my sincere appreciation to Energy Foundation and the Henry Luce Foundation. Uh, without their generous support, uh, uh, I just uh, couldn't uh, organize this event. Thank you very much.